Hello, my name is Lawrence Tratt. Today I'm presenting a demonstration of a prototype editor tool developed jointly with Lucas Diekman in the software development team at King's College London. When we started this project, the question we posed was simple. Is it possible to have the benefits of syntax-directed editing without the downsides? The chief benefit of SDE is that it allows arbitrary languages to be composed without special markers or ambiguity, the two problems that stymie classical parsing approaches. SDE's downside, unfortunately, is that it leads to editors so far removed in feel from a normal text editor that programmers refuse to use them. Recently, JetBrains MPS tool has shown that SDE can be made easier to use than the original tools of the 1980s. However, we believe that one can go much further in providing a tool that, in normal use, feels to programmers just like a traditional editor. The tool that I am about to demonstrate, as crude and simplistic as it is, shows that this goal is achievable. This challenges many deep-seated assumptions about the feasibility of language composition. Let's have a look at the editor itself. On the left we have a component which, when I type, text appears. In fairly traditional text editor expectations. On the right, however, we can see something more unusual. We have a list of languages. In fact, this editor is language aware. So if, for example, I want to edit Java files, I say, I would like to use the Java language. And I then get the Java grammar, lots of details there, we don't want to go into all those, and the tokenizer and lexer. Those really are, for Java 1.5, the grammar and tokenizer rules. And we can see that there's something interesting going on here because we have this tab parse tree. In fact, what we've got here is that the editor is built atop an incremental parser. We use Wagner and Graham's algorithm. And what it means is that as the user types, text is passed on the fly incrementally and minimally. And so we can show the parse tree, which is the tree that's being edited. And even the empty Java file has a valid parse tree. So that's what it looks like. And as I start typing text, it gets put in, at the moment it may seem a little randomly, into the tree. Now the reason that it's not gone in in an obvious way is that we don't yet have a syntactically valid Java file. And we can tell that because the passing status at the bottom left is in red. What we'd expect is that as soon as I type the close curly bracket, the passing status will go to green, and the pass tree on the right will be minimally rewritten to be a correct pass tree. So, let's type the close curly bracket, and as we expect, the tree is updated, so it's now really reflecting the Java grammar. We can see things like our class name C there, and the passing status has gone to green. Now, at all times, the parse tree is being edited, and I want to emphasize that. However, the visualization of the graph tree is done using graphviz, which is a little bit slow for large trees, so I'm just going to turn that off. But be assured that it's always the parse tree that's being edited. So I can now start editing a fairly normal-looking Java program. So let's do something like this. Now, you'll notice that as I start typing, the passing status is going from red to green, as you would expect as the program goes from being syntactically valid to invalid. And I can just carry on typing completely as normal. OK, so we now have, again, a valid Java file, and let's have a quick look at the parse tree. It's a little bit slow to draw, but not too bad at the current stage. And we can see all of our text in there, all relative to the Java grammar, so lots of detail. However, at the moment, this doesn't look too exciting. We don't appear to have done anything very complicated. However, what this particular Java grammar allows us to do is quite interesting. It says that wherever a Java expression is valid, so also is SQL. So, for example, instead of having to pass uh, a manual list into a file, I can say I would like to put in here some Java. And what I do is I press Control Space and say I want to type some SQL. And I start typing SQL. Now, we've got two passing statuses down at the bottom. The Java status is happy because it says, oh, wherever there's a Java right-hand side expression, you can type SQL. I can see an SQL node there. I don't care what its contents are. The SQL um, thing, parsing status is red. 
And that's because we haven't written any valid SQL yet. We have to do something like this. So now we have a valid SQL statement and a valid Java statement, both passing statuses are green. What's going on here? Well, the first thing to notice is that the SQL, it's currently uh, highlighted in a sense, colored. That's what we call a language box. Now, language boxes are based on a very simple observation, which is that in any parser, including an incremental parser, tokens have both a type and a value. The type is derived from the value. So if I get a string like 2 as input, I say the type of the resulting token is int and its value is 2. However, there's no reason why in an incremental parser I can't explicitly create a node of the type that I choose. So what I did by typing control space was I said I want a node of type SQL. And we can really see that lurking around in the tree if we draw it. Now finding these things is always a little bit fun. Ah, here we are. So, the Java expression says, yes, you're referencing the SQL grammar, and here is the SQL parse tree. So that tree, from the point of view of the Java grammar, is just a node in the tree. The Java tree doesn't care what's below here. The SQL tree is happy in its own little bubble, because it's a language box. Now, language boxes are a very simple but a very powerful uh, concept, because effectively they ask the user to disambiguate the language they're choosing and they provide uh, an impermeable membrane. Text cannot move across boundaries. So in other words, the SQL will stay in its little box there. And I can move my cursor in and out of the box, and as I do so, things will be highlighted. If I want to, I can do things like select text from inside a box and paste it outside. At the moment, text when it's selected is just becomes effectively ASCII or Unicode characters, and it loses the notion that it's uh, SQL in this case. That may or may not be a good idea in the long run, but that's a, a usability issue that we haven't yet tackled. Now, the fun thing is that language boxes can be nested arbitrarily deep. So our SQL language here uh, says whenever there's a WHERE statement, the WHERE statement can be normal SQL, or in fact we can embed a Java 1.5 expression. So now we say I'd like to embed a Java 1.5 expression. So now this is a box, a language box, inside a language box. And I can do something like this. Now, in this particular case, that's not a spectacularly useful clause. I could have done something very similar in SQL, but there's no reason why, assuming that this semantically makes sense in the file you're editing in, that a language couldn't allow you to do something like this. Voila. That's perfectly valid Java. The Java 1.5 expression uh, language box is happy. The Java grammar is happy. The SQL grammar is happy. What's also fun is that the expression language to Java 1.5 is mechanically extracted from the overall Java 1.5 grammar. So we have very simple grammar operators underlying this tool that users can edit as they see fit. Now, you can keep on going arbitrarily deep with these things as much as you want. And I think probably a couple of levels really proves the points, but just to show you that we've got here, we've got up here all the Java pass tree, we have here the SQL pass tree, and down here inside the SQL we have the Java 1.5 expression tree. All well and good. What we now have prototype support for is non-textual languages. Now, before I go and explain this, I need to explain one thing that won't be obvious from what you've just seen. You are probably looking at the text on the left and assuming that that is a traditional GUI text component. It is not. In fact, when you type, you are editing text straight into the tree. When you delete things, you're deleting nodes from the tree. We then pretty print the tree on the left. So this is actually just a raw GUI canvas upon which we print text. That allows us to then do the following. I could say, uh, well, sorry, I should say that the Java grammar allows me also to embed what we call a chemical language. Now, this is very simplistic at the moment. It's a little bit of a hack, but it proves the point that non-textual languages work. So again, I press Control Space and say I'd like to put in a chemical. And I type in H2O, and voila, I get the very simple uh, chemical expression for water. 
So again, notice that uh, our Java grammar is happy because it says wherever there's a right-hand side expression, I can type a chemical. Our little chemical language is very happy. It knows about water. And we've got this non-textual thingy lurking around here. Very simple image of water as a chemical diagram. Now imagine that you're, for example, a medical researcher. You don't want to type out H2O as a series of object instantiations and method calls. This syntax makes perfect sense to you. And indeed, we can embed these things in very, very deep and interesting ways. So for example, instead of typing penicillin as a string up here, or maybe reference an object, I can say, I'd like to put the chemical for penicillin in here. Voila, it appears. These concepts are extremely powerful, but they're also completely um, fixed and very uh, systematic. All I'm doing is I'm embedding another language inside a language. And if I was to go and look at the past tree, I would just see a chemical node inside a Java 1.5 expression node, inside an SQL node, and so on and so forth. What you're seeing here is that we can compose languages that are textual and non-textual extremely easily. We can compose them with all the power of syntax-directed editing, but we don't have a syntax-directed editor. I can just edit text just like in a normal editor. It's only when I go inside one of these boxes that I even need to be aware that it exists. Most of the time, I can edit in perfect bliss and ignorance from that. That is a huge change from the traditional editors. And, as I said earlier, the other factor that that gives me is that I do not have to have a valid program at all points. It's quite okay for me to do something like, say, oh, okay, I'm just going to quickly drop in this thing here. Uh... Oh no, I've forgotten to edit something up here and I can go away and change this variable because this should now be called M1 and so on and so forth. And I can edit the file and gradually make the whole thing make sense as I need to. And we can even take in existing large files. So here's one I prepared earlier. This is a, a real Java file, uh, not necessarily a massively exciting one. So the first thing to note is that um, the incremental parser is effectively extremely fast. Um, you have to load up mammoth files to notice any slowdown, and we haven't really optimized the underlying implementation other than making sure that all the algorithms are optimized. So in other words, uh, we've probably got a huge speed factor to be had on this by trying to really uh, factor out every last instruction. But we can, just as, as we could in um, the file above, we can uh, edit straight into a normal job file and everything works. So let's just randomly take a little bit here and say, okay, this thing, this expression here, I don't want that. I want to put some SQL in there. Voila. All of these things make perfect sense. So the editor works just as well for existing files as it does for new ones. Now, that being said, it's of course rather difficult to save things out from here and use them in a traditional toolchain. Once you start composing in even some of these textual languages, if I pass that off to most other tools, they simply cannot pass the result. It's too difficult for them to do. And when you get to uh, non-textual syntaxes like the chemical structure diagram for penicillin or water or whatever, you will not be surprised to learn that not many programming language compilers can take those files in and do much with them. So that is, in a sense, the price that you uh, have to pay for using this rich editor, but I think it's probably a price worth paying. As that also suggests, our tool at the moment is only syntax aware, provided the syntax of a language is correct, as in this case, the tool is happy. It has no idea at the moment what the semantics are, it just assumes you're going to save this file out and you have some other part of the tool chain that does things. Addressing issues like that is very much for future work. The editor also opens up, I believe, a number of very interesting possibilities. Live editing will make a lot of sense here because I'm always editing the tree. Every what appears to be piece of text in this tool is a node in a tree that has an identifier. It gets minimally rewritten, so state is preserved as I edit. Displaying things in this sort of tool dynamically should be very easy. That could make things like debugging composed languages a significantly easier experience than is currently the case. However, all that's for the future. I just want to emphasize before I finish 
that although this editor is simplistic, though it is crude, it really does show that we can get all of the benefits of syntax-directed editing without the disadvantages. We have an editor which feels just like a normal text editor. If you use this only to edit normal Java programs without doing any of the composition, you will not be able to tell that it's not whatever your favorite editor is, Vi or Emacs or so on. It feels exactly like that. That is a big shift from previous work. And I think it's very exciting and it's something that we really want to work on further in the future to really take this idea to its logical end. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the demo. If you'd like to find out more about our work, I would encourage you to visit our website at soft-dev.org where you can find downloads, more papers, and so on and so forth. And I wish you a very good day wherever you are. Goodbye.